Hello, my name's Liz Shercliffe. I'm with you from St Thomas's Church in Mellor in South Manchester and I work for the Diocese of Chester as Director of Studies. I want to begin with this morning's New Testament reading from Morning Prayer. It's an interesting story. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they'd stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things that they'd seen. Truths made the headlines this week. That's not a sentence you might normally expect to hear over the airwaves, although it's likely to be one that you wish was true. I'm not talking about whether or not headlines reveal truth, or even acknowledge it. I mean the public argument between Facebook and Twitter, or rather Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey, about whether or not claims made in social media by high-profile people should be fact-checked. The view expressed by the White House and enshrined in an executive order is that fact-checking is political activism. How might fact or truth-checking be considered political activism? It depends, of course, on what you consider truth to be. Is it a concept that's infinitely malleable, that changes with public opinion? Are other things that are simply and intrinsically true? Dorsey said, I am not an arbiter of truth. And he was right. Today's Bible reading The story of Jesus taking some followers up a mountain and God somehow revealing who Jesus is suggests something very important. There is truth. Ultimately, it's not decided, but discerned. It's not arbitrated, but revealed. It's never altered by opinion, no matter how widely shared that opinion might be. Researchers in all areas of study know that eureka moment when previously incomprehensible problems suddenly become clear. Spiritually, it's sometimes called a kairos moment, a moment when things come together, when we know something we didn't know before. And as a result of that knowing, change is possible. The time we live in has been called post-truth. It indicates a time when truth plays almost no role in influencing public opinion and things are determined by how they make us feel. In our reading, Peter's request that they stay on the mountain because it feels good is perhaps a first century version of post-truth thinking. God's response is, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. In other words, it doesn't matter what makes you feel good. I want you to find truth by following. Of course, for Christians, 
Truth is discovered in following Jesus, who claimed not to know the truth, but to be the truth.